Like sometimes the tech can just get in the way of just fucking toughen up and get in there and get it done. <laughs> So, Steve, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, man? Yeah, very well. Thank you, mate. Very yeah. well. So I think this episode, you know, we're really looking into sort of like the future of the fitness industry, which is sort of tech and home gyms. Because I think since COVID started, there's been more of a push for people, one, looking at their health um, after this big health scare and media paranoia we've lived through for the last couple of years. And when people couldn't go to the gym, they had to adapt. So let's first talk about the home gym thing because you've got a fantastic home gym setup, which I'm yeah. very jealous of living in a box. In <laughs> um, what was the reason you decided to build your home gym? Well, I was working at a gym facility for someone. So for me, that next step was to move on and run my own business. And I've got the space here at home in the backyard and the beautiful Perth Australian weather to do exactly that. So I did it. And, um, you know, for me, it makes sense. I do way less hours and I make way more money and I'm in charge of my equipment and everything I do. So it just makes complete sense for me for that next step. I've worked at commercial gyms and small boutique gyms. I've, I've done it, you know what I mean? So having this is nice. And I know you do a bit of online coaching now and things like this, but what what is it that made you rather than having your own business, having control of your own diary, you could have freelanced in the gym and saved yourself the, I, I, I've been on calls with you where you've been building stuff and all that hard work and the cost that probably comes, we'll talk about that later in setting up your own gym. Why did you decide to do what is probably in a way the more complicated up for an option for a home gym, as opposed to these lower barrier to entry options to scale your business? You know what? I The, the, the first one was... I, wanted, I didn't want to pay the rent to use someone's facility when I don't need all that equipment. I, I, I listened to someone's podcast. I can't remember what it was. And when they get interns in, they make them stay in, you know, the, the, the gym mats. They're like a meter by a meter, right? Yeah. Those, those sort of rubber gym mats. And they make them stay in that box and work with their clients and, and, I don't even know if they give them any equipment. They say, I want you to spend the day in that box, only in that box with your clients that come in and you have to coach them. So, and I thought about that. I thought, I don't need all that equipment. I don't need all that space. As a good coach, you, you should be able to coach in that, in that square, right? Obviously, I've got more than a meter square now. You know what I mean? I've got a couple of, you know, more than that. But you got a conditioning track. <laughs> got, it's yeah, not I just a home gym anymore. I built a conditioning track. I built it myself. I'm, I'm very proud of what I've done out there. Have you so, always been builder minded? Is it is that have you been brought up into DIY? No, my old man, my old man is like in, like he did building and all that. You know what I mean? So um, I studied carpentry at school and all that. So I think if I wasn't um, if I wasn't pushing to be like if I wasn't weren't a trainer, I'd probably be in a trade like carpentry or something like that. You know what I mean? I, I love it. I enjoy it. Building That's my, my biggest hair. fear about having a home gym when I go back to the UK is that I'm just not DIY minded whatsoever. So I'd probably have to spend more than I need to or just hire you to help me out. <laughs> That's it. I was actually thinking of putting some YouTube videos together to show people how you could do it. I think that's a great idea. Like, Because I think, you know what I mean? Like I'm doing it now and I can't imagine going back to a gym now. Like the things that I miss about being in a gym is the environment, the band are, being around a lot of people, obviously working from home, it's just me and my clients. It's a lot more, it's a lot more lonely. And actually me and the missus, like the other day, Lana is a school teacher. So she spends all week teaching and socializing with teachers. By the weekend, she's fucked. She doesn't want to do anything like socially, you know, like we've, you know, what I mean? that like, feeling. whereas I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm at home all day. That's why I go to the other gym to train so I can get out of the house and get out of the gym. By the weekend, I'm like, I want to, you know what I mean? I want to interact more. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? There's the, the pros and cons there. But like I said earlier, <clears throat> the amount of work I have to do for the money I make and to be in control and in charge, the pros outweigh the cons, you know what I mean? I think it's interesting you talk about that, that whatever that podcast was where they, they make the guys train with minimal equipment in a meter square. 
I think it's a valuable skill. I was I had a I was sitting on a podcast uh, yesterday with um, Alex Searle recording for Monday's episode. It's what makes a good personal trainer, and we were we were we were talking about like skills of, like if you can learn psychology, yeah, you can make any diet work because you can work with your clients, and if you know your anatomy, you can make any program work if you change gyms or if you something happens, right? And this is kind of what happened during COVID, right? Everyone got so, me included to a degree, I was advantaged, I, I spent years studying my anatomy, I could work stuff out. But we're so spoiled in these big, you know, big box gyms or these really fancy boutique gyms that as soon as you take away our inclined hyper away from us, like people don't know what to do. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So yeah. like going into like the pros and cons, like you obviously highlighted it there. Other than like the things for your business, what do you reckon, if someone's listening to go, I want a home gym, but I don't really know if it's the right thing for me. What are the biggest pros in your mind of having a home gym set? The biggest pros are as, as, as a trainer, you get to select your own equipment. You know what I mean? You can choose what you want. And if you want to buy something else, obviously you just go buy it or you, you, you can swap something else for something in, you know what I mean? Um, so I get to select my own equipment. You know what I mean? I ain't got no stupid shit in here. You know what I mean? No TRX, nothing like that. Not that that's bad equipment. It's just not my style and my um, my style of training. Um, so I get to select my equipment. Um, what else? I don't know. Like that's that's the main things really, isn't it? For me, like equipment selection. Um, I can choose how I want to work. You know, like how I want to dress. You know what I mean? My, like, you know what I mean? All, you know, just simple things that you may overlook. I suppose um, the convenience of it is an advantage for you because you're so into your training. I yeah. think the biggest problem I find with people who have home gym setups is if it's at home, so often it collects dust yeah. because they can just go, oh, I'll just finish this next bit of work or I'll watch one more episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and then they never actually train. I suppose you don't see that because you're so into your training, but that's my yeah. biggest word of warning when I see people go, do I want to set up a home gym? It's like, well, it's a very expensive like storeroom. The thing is, right, I, I set this gym up and I had minimal equipment to start with, yeah? I had six mats, yeah? And then I built my own weightlifting platform. So I got a load of plywood and I built the platform and then I, I, I had a, like a five, six, $500 rack, which was really shitty rack, a power rack, and I, I put it on top. And then I think I had a set of dumbbells and the worst banged out benches that you can imagine. I had a flat bench and an incline bench that were smashed to pieces. And then I had, I think I had like a couple of bands and a seated calf raise. Like that, that was all I had. That was Why all is I a seated had. calf raise, my ass? I found it on, um, I found it on Marketplace for like 30 bucks. <laughs> In COVID, I then sold it for about 150, 160 bucks. How good's that? You Not made a profit on a uh, calf raise. But actually it was brilliant. It was a brilliant car phrase. It was brilliant. Did you go around your gym just insulting people's cars until someone bought it? <laughs> so basically, um, I, all I had was that equipment, right? And then over time, as I, you know, like I knew that I was going to be transitioning to my home gym full time. So this was before I started working from home full time. I was just doing a few clients around my full time um, gig at the other gaff, at the other place, yeah? And then all right, cool. I better start investing in the once I had those basics in the rack, the bar, um, dumbbells, cheap dumbbells, and a calf raise machine. I knew I could work with people, yeah, and um, still deliver good sessions and get good results. So the next step was all right. I better make this look better. All right, I bet it's getting cold in the winter. It's, it's a tin shed. All right, let me let me put some insulation and some walls up. All right, so I got some insulation. I got some uh, wood and I put it all up and I painted the gym, made it look nice. And then the next step was aesthetics, went to the shop, got a few pictures for the walls. Um, what else did I do? I put a couple of shelves up, a couple of plants up as well. Give it that nice look, you know what I mean? Natural look. And then- Your um, YouTube studio. Yeah, my little YouTube studio. And th that was the next step. And I didn't really upgrade my equipment until I was- really into making money on a full-time basis so after the first month of work um then i upgraded um a few things like you know i took the benches to this guy out in the hills 20 minutes away 
and he powder coated them for me and he did all the upholstery again. So give me new backboards, give me new um, new covers. And they came back. I, sp I spent like 200, 300 bucks on these two benches. They look incredible, tr absolutely transformed. They look like brand new benches. Mm. Do, so that, what, that was, do you have a bit of a shock when like, because obviously when people think about building a home gym, they, they price up equipment, right? They go, okay, this is what my racks going to cost, this is what my dumbbells going to cost. Did you find that sometimes the, the hidden things added up to a big things like plywood flooring, like pictures, like paint, like soundproofing, you know, with those things, did they add up quite big? Yeah. Oh, big time. They, they, of course they add up like this, this shit is expensive. You know what I mean? But like I, I worked from having nothing in the gym and like the bare real minimum basics, you know what I mean? Shitty benches, dumbbells, a really poor power rack, but every client that come in, they didn't care. You know what I mean? As you know, the clients didn't care. They come for me to have a good session. They still get effective workouts because, like you said there, if you understand the anatomy and, and um, psychology and, and, you know, physiology of how to work with someone and how to put a program together, you're going to make it work. And I made it work after, a, you know, like I said, after a month, then I, then I got that first upgrade. You know what I mean? The, the um, environment, you know what I mean? I made it look better. I made it warmer for the winter. Um shit like that you know what i mean and then it was the next step let me invest in um what did i get next i think i got um what did i get um i think i got a few small bits like a stability ball and then a nice foam roller and maybe spent a couple of hundred bucks so it's always investments into the gym then i got a nice power rack then i got a nicer bumper plates then i got an air dine then i got a rower then i got this and cable and over time as your business improves then you can invest in better equipment but you don't need to do all that at once looking back now if someone was going to start to build a home gym on a budget and they can buy three pieces of equipment what three pieces of equipment would you encourage them to start with i would encourage them to start with a, an adjustable bench mm -hmm. all right so we can go flat to the inclines mm -hmm. i would recommend them to buy a set of dumbbells, all right, which is, you know, yes, they can be expensive, but they're going to last you forever. They're going to last and you They don't need to be Watson dumbbells. They don't need to have they your logo on them, you know. Spinning revolution dumbbells, yeah. <laughs> they can just be basic hex dumbbells that you can get from China or anywhere else. You know what I mean? Do you like the to keep Watson up. spinning dumbbells? I find them really odd. I find them more off-putting than beneficial to have the spin. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially as spotting. As... I feel dangerous spotting with people, like helping yeah. people up the dumbbells. Yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. I, I, I mean, the only time I was exposed to them was at UP, you know what I mean? And uh, whatever, innit? Like, yeah, the distribute um, the stress across the joints. Uh, if you lift in properly, so what? You're going to lift well anyway, you know what I mean? Like, it's such a minutia thing. It's not, it's not, it's really not worth it, right? It's, 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 yeah, whatever, innit? You know what I mean? And then, so I reckon it adjustable bench, a set of decent dumbbells. And then, you know what? The third thing, I'd probably go with bands, mm. power bands. You can pull, you can pal off, you can do your mobility drills, you can do all different fancy stuff with them. You know what I mean? Like power bands, you know, the big long power bands, not those booty mini bands. <laughs> long power bands. That's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think during lockdown, I, I, I developed such a hate relationship with bands. I just got so sick of them. They're really good for some stuff, terrible for others. But I think yeah. on a budget, that's got to be where you start. Right? Like your back work is not going to be ideal. You're going to be looking at prone dumbbell rows and then banded pull downs. Are, is banded pull down great? No. But if you're on a budget, you're not going to be able to afford a row pull down attachment, are you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's a good. I think that's a good. Um, a good free list of equipment. I think. Yeah. What would you buy if money wasn't an object? If you had three pieces of equipment to start with, what would you buy? If money wasn't an object, I would buy what as my first three pieces of equipment. And you can you can name drop brands here. We're not sponsored by any brand. If anyone's wondering, oh, but like man, you can man. name drop brands if you think. You know what? I, again, I would go with a real high quality adjustable bench. Mm. So that's that's the same as the first but just a better quality, maybe one that goes into a decline angle as well. Um, the second one, again, dumbbells. 
but just maybe better quality dumbbells. Yeah. And then the third one, probably, um, well, and don't no say bar. plates because I'll, I'll assume plates are included. If you say a bar, we're going to buy, we're going to, no, no, not even a bar. Actually, I wouldn't do that. Maybe I, no. I would, maybe I would choose a, um, the third one. I would probably choose a pulley machine, like a pull down row combo. Like I've got in there, which is, it's a game changer. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. One of the things I would probably buy, um, just because I know it, it would take up very little space. I'm going to name drop a brand, but it take up very little space, but it, it, it's really well kitted out for home gyms. Have you ever seen the Prime Podigy rack? Yeah. So like, for those who people that don't know or listen to this, Prime are, I think, a Canadian company, aren't they? And they do a lot of um, resistance machines that work with the strength curve, but they're often very, very big. But they created this rack which is basically like a squat rack where you can adjust it, but you can attach pull downs and rows and cables into it. So it's a it's like a dual cable, a pull down, and the squat rack all in one. I think that's a great space saver for what you have. And I, you know what? I tell you what, I would I wouldn't. I I think I one of the last things I would buy is a barbell. I mean, the fact yeah. that I'm not built to get under a bar doesn't help. But I'd probably buy a trap bar and a safety bar yeah. before I buy a straight bar. Yeah, because safety. especially when I'm working with clients. 90% of people are going to use those before they use the straight bar, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, I, I use a straight bar quite a lot with my clients, you know. Um, obviously not at first, but I, I, straight bar is a lot, um, gets a lot of use from me, you know, whether that's for presses, rows, um, overhead squats, if they can do that sort of stuff, deadlifts. Mm. Yeah, I use the bar a lot, actually. Yeah, I use the bar a lot. Deadlifts. What's your setup now? So you've got you've got your rack, you've got your dumbbells, you've got your adjustable bench, you've got your pull um, down. Yeah. So right now I've got my. I'll go through what I have. Yeah, I got the, the I got the Rogue uh, Monster Rack, which is brilliant, um, which has the safety straps, which are mm-hmm. like fabric straps that sort of kill the bar. They look after the bar better. They don't make any noise when you lower the bar into the into the safeties. They're brilliant. Um, what else do I have? I have um, a lot of rogue stuff. I've got a good rogue barbell, rogue calibrated plates. Um, rogue barbells are really good. Yeah, really good. Yeah, really good. Very, very uh, well made. Um, I've got, a, I got from one kilo to 40 kilo um, dumbbells, like just the hex dumbbells, you know, simple hex dumbbells. I've got um, a ton of power bands. Um, what else do I have? I'm going around the room. I've got a, I've got a sled and a prowler with a rope um, and the handles to push. Um, what else do I have? I have with that rope you can then use for battle ropes if you want. Not that I use it for that. Um, so obviously I got the sled track that I built out there for that. Um, how long did that take to make? How how much of a, a mission was it to build a track in your garden? It was enjoyable actually. Um, maybe a week. That's not bad. Not working every day on it, you know. Basically, it was all soil, sand. Our like purpose most it was, it was all sand, right? So I had to um, compact the sand, level it out. Then I put cracker dust down, which is like um, a combination of a few materials. I don't know, explain what it is. Um, compacted that flat. Actually, I, I compacted it, and when I screeded it, I just screeded it down slope so that water could drain onto the grass. Um, and then I found and exterior AstroTurf that was good in the sun. Um, I got that shipped in for, you know, $800 or whatever from somewhere. And then I cut it and laid it down, glued it down. And yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Mm. It's way simpler than I thought it would be to make something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was easy. It was easy. I had, you know what I mean? Like, I watched a lot of videos, spoke to a few people. And um, yeah, did that. that was, yeah, that's, that's really beneficial because I don't just use it for sled work. We use it for warm up drills, all different stuff. You know, what I mean, sprinting if I'm working with like some of the boys, like some of the kids, etc., stuff like that. Uh, it's about 12, 13 meters, I think it is. Do you think um, a gym setup differs whether you're at a coach, athlete, or just a recreational trainee? Because obviously, I mentioned from yeah, I think from so. a coach perspective yeah, that I wouldn't buy a barbell and you said you probably would, but you deal with a lot of the athletic population, which probably I've been using a barbell for years. Like how would, how would it differ depending on like the people you're working with or the person you are? Um, well, like the athletic population that I work with is probably 
30, 40% of my business. All right. And we do a lot of power Olympic lifting. We do like this from the simplest ones, from squat jumps with the barbell on our backs to, um, you know, cleans and overhead squats and snatches. We, so you need a bar for that stuff. Like you're going to get the best peak power outcomes from using the barbell and load as opposed to doing dumbbell snatches or kettlebell snatches. You know mm. what I mean? So we need a safety bar for that as well because it would dump backwards if you start <laughs> yeah, to jump, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the barbell is essential for us, but we could probably work a whole training phase. And you know what? We could probably go 12 months without using a bar if we, if we didn't have access to one. You know what I mean? There's so many different ways you can skin the cat. You know what mm. I mean? Um, so... Yeah, yeah, I'd like if I if I've got access to a bar, I'll use it for my athletic based clients. Hmm. And is that the only main change you would have between the between the, the three? Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the elderly population, which is my other sort of third of my business, elderly meaning sixty plus, they're there for mobility, they're there for strength, they're there for sort of cardiac health. And, and and stuff like that. So the bar is an essential. You know what I mean? Dumbbell is actually not that essential either. Mm. Would you be looking at more stuff that's going to allow them to get into end ranges? So for sake of all, would heel wedges and obviously conditioning stuff and things yeah. like that become more yeah. dowels to yeah. hold on to become more important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, what do I do a lot with my elderly pop? You know, we use a lot of, we use a lot of the step in the block. You know what I mean? For mm. step up variations to split squat variations. We use a lot of bands as well for joint mobilization. Um, actually, I, I use a ton of cardiovascular equipment with them. So we use the sled a lot for sled pushes, sled drags, because it's low impact and it's simple to do. Mm. And it's sort of that end range sort of joint angle. Um, lots of air dying, lots of rowing. Yeah. Um, uh, and then lots of body weight drills. You know what I mean? Like, do a lot of FRC, functional range conditioning sort of stuff. You know what I mean? You don't need equipment for that. So when it comes to sort of wrap up the home gym stuff a little bit here, if someone was looking, listening to this and going, right, I've got some advice. I'm pretty certain now that I want to set up my home gym. Do you, do you know like roughly how much your gym has cost to date? I'd have to work it out, but I reckon um, t- like from the day I started it, probably... I want to say 20 to 25k. Oz, Australian, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, what do you reckon the minimal cost would be? Like when you did your first, you know, itineration of the gym, what are you looking at? Three grand. So it's actually not as expensive as you probably think. Because a lot of people, one of the things that probably puts people off is thinking how expensive it could be. But it's, it's expensive or as cheap as you make it, I suppose. Listen, I'm sure you're aware. Some people are like impulse buyers, which I may be a little bit like that as well. But like with experience, you know what you need and you know what you don't need. Like for ages, for the last two years, I've been weighing up and wanting to get a safety squat bar. Mm. But I still haven't got it yet because I know that for me and my clientele, the trap bar should come first. I know that, um, you know, you know, little things like that. You know what I mean? I know that um, the pulley machine should come first. You know what I mean? So it's my clients and it's my training style. I know I can categorize what needs to come in first, you know? Um, but yeah, probably all up now, 25K, I'd say. In there. I suppose I suppose it might be good if someone's listening to this who aren't a coach themselves and don't know necessarily um, how they move or what bits of kit works for them. Probably worth going in and finding a trainer in your area that understands mechanics and the way people move and what ranges you own to see what actually, so you're not wasting money and wasting time. Like someone has got external rotation that can't get behind a bar. Is it a waste of time buying a barbell? So they save yourself your money, buy a trap bar and a safety bar. But someone yeah. that's got a really long femur, you might want to invest in the heel wedges. So you may want to actually then cut back on something else. So yeah, maybe yeah. it's a good, if, if someone wants to this and wants to build a home gym, maybe go and find a good trainer, get them to do a yeah. bit of an assessment and then work out what would work well for your structure, it, function. Yeah, I, and there'll definitely be some basics that you've got to get down. But like, even like, I don't have any heel wedges. Mm. Like I got, I got three pairs of weightlifting shoes in there. 
two of them are from me over the years. And then one pair is I was working with um, a female lifter and she got a new pair. So she said, do you want these? I said, yeah, cool. Let's leave them here. Now all my clients with size six, seven feet wear those weightlifting shoes. How small are your feet? You're six or seven? No, no, no. These, no, the girl no, no, no. <laughs> these were my these were my client's shoes. Oh. <laughs> she said, Do you want them? Cause I, I was thought, yeah, I can use them for all my for all my clients. Right? Is that your like, intake form now? If you if you're if you're you have to be six or seven for a girl, like 10, 11 for a guy, and if your feet don't match these, you can't come and train with me. Basically. Yeah, yeah. an intake form. Otherwise, that's it. Your squatting's over. Your gobbler squatting forever. You can't yeah, get past 20 kilo yeah. dumbbells. <laughs> So what that, that's what advice, I do now. So yeah. What bit of advice would you give to someone who listens to this and goes, I'm going to start my home gym? What's like one big bit of advice you would have to get them started in the right direction? Make sure you talk to your neighbors, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a story in this, right? Music. Well, the thing is, like, you, you want to be pally with your neighbors, yeah, because you've got people turning up at your fucking house that some people ain't gonna seen before. You know what I mean? Like you know, if your business is going, you've got people turning up every 45, 60 minutes. You know what I mean? Neighbors going to be like, what's going on? You know what I mean? Who is this? Report you, whatever. Like, um, you, you like, <laughs> drug dealer. <laughs> I'm working, I'm working from home. So, I mean, it, you ask me that question. I'm always thinking about the coaches that want to set up the home gym. Mm. Yeah. Like keep your gym on the low. That's what I would recommend. Like keep your business on the low. Keep, let your neighbors know that you're, you've got a home gym. Because there's certain times of the day when you're going to have music going, it's going to be a bit loud. Um, you're going to have people to come into your house. You know what I mean? Some of my clients come at like 5.15 in the morning. Their cars are quite loud. You know what I mean? So <laughs> be nice. Hello, building neighbor. noise and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, all my clients know that... Um, Sorry, let me rephrase that. Like my clients know that we're in residential area, so we can't be stupid with the music and the noise. You know what I mean? So, but you know that's why those little things are really important. You know, like the safety rack. You know, I've got the fabrics. Mm. When we do deadlifts and rack falls, it doesn't make a noise. Yeah. When you teach your client how to deadlift from the floor, put it down softly. It's called a dead lift. You're meant to pull it from a dead stop. Don't worry about touch and go reps. So things like that, you know what I mean? Teach your clients how to lift properly and execute techniques properly, how to wreck the bar properly. Little things like that, minimize the noise. Mm. So you know like I mean? move, moving, on, moving on to tech, before we sort of break down a few of the more common pieces of, of fitness tech out there at yeah. the moment, <laughs> what do you own and what personally could you not live without? What, tech-wise? Yeah. Um, heart rate monitor. Uh, so a blood a blood pressure monitor blood pressure thing. okay yeah 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 now, is yeah, that yeah. is that your one piece of the only thing you feel you couldn't live without oh i don't know man like What's you know what i love my watch i love yeah. my watch is that a garmin it's a garmin yeah i love my watch like so personally you know what i mean i love this because it's got my stopwatch it's got my step count it's got my heart rate it's got my oxygen saturation levels not that i ever use it it's got all that shit, you know what I mean? So I can track my, my heart rate averages, my resting heart rates and all that sort of shit. So I love that. Um, my but, Garmin. Um, one of the main reasons was I like the Apple Watch, but I didn't want to have it linked to my um, phone and my email and stuff. I didn't want to have a lot of distractions. Although I'm fully aware that this can do the same thing, it can you can get all your notifications on it from your phone and email anyway, but I don't know. I just I, I don't know. That would that was that was my go to. And I've uh, from what I've read, this is better for performance. I, I I would agree with that. I think it's something where people don't think about as well, right? Because how many people, especially if you're a more recreational trainee that isn't like yet as committed to training as like Steve is committed to training. Imagine people rest too long in training anyway. And imagine if you get your emails and all your notifications and your Instagram, and you now want to go and check your phone. Oh, man. The amount of time yeah. you probably waste in training because of that Apple Watch. I've literally, and like, you know, two, three times a week, I go to the local gym because it gets me out the house, it gets me out the home gym, and I do my, I get some steps in for 15 minutes. So I walk to the gym, yeah, get some sunshine. 
And the only thing that annoys me is when people are sitting there on the machines, like everyone listening, I'm sure you're aware, when people waste time on their phones on the machine in between their sets, I'm like, for fuck's sake, they're doing my head in. Thumb Just training. Like, really oh, strong man. hypertrophy in the thumbs. Yeah. And, and listen, sometimes, yeah, cool. You get caught slipping you're on your phone. You've taken too much rest period. But if it's between every set, for fuck's sake, it drives me insane. <laughs> but I don't let my clients do that. I do not let my clients do that. No, I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. Like, if, if, if you've got a big work bit, like deadline, then fair enough. But you shouldn't be like on your phone all the time. Because if you, so you think, you're fine a distraction. Yeah. So I think my watch, not that I can't live without it, but like, this is my favorite tech. Yeah. Mm. And then there's, for work related purposes, it's obviously my blood, my blood pressure. Um, yeah. Monitor. Why would you say blood pressure? I totally agree with you. That's my first bit of kit, I think. But why a blood pressure cut? Oh man, like it's just so important. And you know, and other good quality coaches know, like if you ain't checking that, you may run into problems. You know what I mean? First of all, it should be part of your, um, you know, your health assessment anyway. When people come in, you need to check. Don't just go off what they tell you. Check their blood pressure, check their resting heart rate, um, and then use that to monitor going forward, especially because I work with, you know, 60 plus. I have, a, I, I have a, a love-hate relation with blood pressure testing. I value the importance, and it's called the silent killer for a reason. Right? We see people yeah. with high blood pressure that lose it. But I find yeah. it's – I do think it's the most inaccurate form of testing because so many things affect it, and you can never truly standardize it. You know, we talk about how uh, body weight is, has fluctuations, but you can take a real average in body weight, right? There is a trend. Things can they go up a little bit, and it trends down. Blood pressure can be wild – depending on so many things that aren't in our control. Like I go to the doctors and I'm sure a lot of people listen to this also do the same and they get white coat syndrome. So I always have high blood pressure when I go to the doctors. But when I check at home in the morning, no issues. You don't have caffeine, you have a bad night's sleep, you're stressed. You, there's so many factors that affect it. But, that but, I but, never ever look at a blood pressure reading and I go, I trust this is accurate. Never, never once in my career. But this is the thing, like, you know, when it comes to tech, you know, the two most important things is reliability and val validity, all right? Now, reliability is how consistent the measurement is. Can the results be reproduced under the same conditions, all right? Is it reliable tech, all right? And a blood pressure monitor, it, yes, it is. I mean, they use it in healthcare, you know what I mean? And then is it valid? Is it accurate? And yeah, yes, it is. The, the problem is like what you're saying is if is the client coming in in the same circumstances you know what i mean have they had caffeine are they well hydrated are they stressed did they have poor sleep the night before all those factors right mm. but when it comes to this but when you look at you can say that with like body weight right because yeah. it's fairly easy give or take a little bit of variance to be in circumstances that are not going to affect body weight but the, we we can't say is the client coming in in consistent circumstances because they could have someone just go, hey, there's an extra deadline or hey, your, your mum's got sick or your dog's a bit ill, right? These completely out of our control things doesn't just change blood pressure a little bit. Wild discrepancies in blood pressure. You can go from being low blood pressure to hypertension by having a bit of bad news. Yeah, yeah. No, you're that's right, you're my, right. And that's my problem with it. I, I still think, um, yeah, I agree. I, I still think it's a measurement that should be done. And, um, you know, you, you're looking at the trend over time. You know what I mean? If the trend over time is it's going down or maintaining, then that's a good thing. If, if it's trending up, then it's a bad thing. You know what I mean? So it's different data sets. It's different data points. You know what I mean? Like like fat loss, right? You, you weigh in a lot. And if it's going down, then we know you're on the right track. You know, I think that's how you need to take blood pressure as well. You can't just take one set of points and say all right boom you know what i mean so i think it's a good thing to invest in your own blood pressure cuff because i think when you test it any test you should do i think with blood pressure let's say i'm doing a measurement session in the gym i will do blood pressure when they come in chill them out have a conversation blood pressure yeah. do the yeah. calipers do the circumference measurements blood pressure so we get them to relax a little bit more and then what i would probably do from there is in the first like three four weeks if someone really if i'm worried about them I go buy your own blood pressure cuff and take this every single morning under the same conditions and we try yeah. and standardize yeah. it. And then we can go to once every four weeks or once every eight weeks just to check it. But 
Yeah. I think if you're not taking it daily, this especially early on, there's so much wild variance. It, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Borderline redundant. And and again, it's like how you um it's not even how you interpret the result in it, it's how you actually um you know like the advice you give from the result you know what i mean like just one you know i mean you get someone in check their blood pressure once you know the history and what they're going through where they're at um then you advise them with their hydration their nutrition and if there's a, some concern you have to go to the doctor check it out in it and then over time we work on this you know what i mean so um you know what i mean yeah, and, yeah. It, and it, it does allow you to adjust training, like as you're aware, you know what I mean? It allows you to adjust training. So let me move on to like some of the more common bits of tech. And I think it's good. I'm glad that you mentioned blood pressure first because it, despite my skepticism with the reliability of it, it is a really important piece of tech. I think everyone should do, use. And I think everyone should probably buy their own because it's not really yes, thing. Apple Watch Think Group. And there's no point checking HRV if you don't know where your blood pressure's at. And I think getting it done at the doctor's or getting it done at your personal training session is a pretty useless endeavor because it's going to be wildly different. But if you take it in the first thing in the morning, relax, maybe chill out. I often like, if I was going to take blood pressure, I'd probably do some like 10 minutes of meditation first, get myself in a relaxed state, take it, as opposed to taking it just so I've woken up. Because that waking up in itself will rise blood pressure. Yes, so, yeah, you're right, you're right. So there's, yeah. there's so many variants. I think that's why it's worthwhile having your own one. But often, like the the big common thing, let's just address the elephant in the room first when it comes to fitness tech, because we're normally talking watches, rings, root bands, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that a lot of people look at first when you get them is calorie counting. What's your take on the calorie counts on these things? How much accurate, how accurate are they? And how much stock can we take in the calorie counts on these devices? I mean, you know, like... That's probably the biggest issue with these um, watches that 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 track people's calories. You know, I used to do classes at the other gym, and some people are like, "Oh my god, that was a that was a brutal session. I burned seven hundred calories." I'm like, "So what? Who fucking cares? It doesn't matter." Yes, you burnt seven hundred calories because your fucking heart rate so high for so long. That doesn't mean we're you know that doesn't mean we are actually like, you know, accurately burning 700 calories. And what does it matter anyway? Because, you know, when you train, it only constitutes for maybe, what, 5% of your overall calorie expenditure in the day? So, you know, like, that that's where people, it encourages people to think about their training, like, you know, this is when they're burning fat and burning calories, you know, which we know that isn't the case. Yeah, I think I think when, it, when you're looking at calorie counts on these things, it's yeah. basically how we're interpreting it. And a lot of people put an oversimplistic view on calories yeah. in versus calories out and yeah. think, well, my watch tells you I burned 700 calories. So now I can eat 700 calories extra. And this <sighs> is the reason why people end up getting so frustrated of lack of weight loss because they go, I'm in the deficit, I'm following it. But yeah. they're not telling you the extra 700 because their watch is validated to them that that's the right idea to go. Yeah. And yeah. they're not taking into account, okay, so let's say you burnt 700 calories. One, very unlikely. That's based on heart rate, not based on weight, size, um, genetic factors, basal metabolic rates, thermic effects of food, neat and non-exercise, what you're fidgeting the rest of the day. All these things constitute the calories out part of the equation. Your digestive health, your health and nutrient absorption all dictate this. You yeah. cannot say that this thing actually burns that. So I would, the biggest bit of advice I would give with these, these watches and things like this is do not influence your nutrition based off this. But yeah. you want to use it as a baseline. I, the way I use calories <clears throat> as opposed to time in terms of cardio sometimes is that when you're doing steady state cardio, someone will go for 30 minutes, let's say. Week one, because they're motivated, they're power walking 30 minutes. Week six, as their knee drops, they're just going through a gentle stroll. And they don't realize they've burnt less calories. So if I say burn 300 calories on the treadmill, it is the same, even though it's probably not 300 calories, it's the same output each time. So if it takes you 15 minutes on week one and 20 minutes on week six, it's the same amount of output. And so at least I get a consistent level, but I certainly don't take stock of the calories. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, 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 I get you. Yeah, and um, I, that's where obviously the, the watches that track the calories are um, doing somewhat of an injustice to um, people's understanding, right? To um, 
calories in versus calories out, you know? And it really is not good because it, like, like we said there, it, it teaches people, it, it reinforces to people that, oh, it's about the workout and how hard you're working, um, which is a big part of it, of course, but it's not the main reason why we um, train, right? Hmm. That's so the right way to put it. Yeah, so we're looking at three main things that people want. So if, if you were going to pick one, we've got the Apple Watch, we've got the Aura Ring, and we've got the Whoop. These are the three main ones that people use, other than your Garmin. Yeah. If you were going to pick one of those to buy, which one would it be and why? I would use, um, say those three again, Apple Watch. Aura Ring, Whoop. Um, I would go with, um, from what I know, I would go with the Whoop. Why the Whoop band? I think um, I've never used it, but I've, and I've had haven't had any clients use it, but I know I've got friends that have used it, and um, they like the way it tracks their HRV, their sleep, and it tracks a lot of things, right? A lot of physiological uh, metrics. I think it's the most rate, yeah skin temperature. I think it tracks uh, respiratory rate or something else as well. Yes. And, I think it's know. the most useful out of these trackers in terms of what to use. I, I think Apple Watch does some stuff. But I think it, it, in, in tip, I look at the Apple Watch, I look at it, they build it like they build the iPhone in the sense of they've got the technology to have so much more stuff on it, but they don't. And it's they're, they're delaying it so they can add you, sell you the next Apple Watch. Mm, and I, mm. So like HRV wasn't added until like the latest generation ones. Yeah. I also think there's so much stuff in there that it could be a really good fitness tracker or a really terrible one, depending on the apps that you've got on your phone that work for it. And we already mentioned the distractions and I've got an Apple watch and I, I forget to charge it all the time and I don't use it that much for what it's for. You know, it, yeah. it, for me, it's a stopwatch. It's, and it's a clock and that is literally a watch, you know, and that's basically it. So I've also got an aura ring, but I haven't got a root band, but I've got a lot of clients to do. And looking at the two, I think the aura ring apparently being on the finger is much more accurate for resting heart rate much more accurate for HRV and um, to some extent, maybe sleep because okay. it's easy to wear during sleep. So I do think the O-ring, if you're looking for accuracy, is probably the best metric. The one thing the O-ring doesn't do is, is actually track your performance during training. So it's purely a recovery tool. And, that, and that's, you, that's it. You know, like one of my online clients, right? He has an aura ring and he uses it to gauge whether he's going to train or not. But like sometimes the tech can just, get in the way of just fucking toughen up and get in there and get it done. <laughs> right? That is your, that is the clip I'm going to take for the show. For fuck's sake. It, sometimes it does my nothing. I, I couldn't agree more. HRV is one of these things that's become so popular recently and very few people know how to interpret it. it yes. You are looking at it in the same way we spoke about blood pressure, right? You're looking at broader trends over time. I don't care what your HRV is. I care is what's happening to it. And I'll pause people, you for one sec. I just need to go for yeah. a piss. <laughs> I'll pause you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing with the aura ring is that like a lot HRV has become such a popular thing, but very few people know how to interpret it. It's the trends that we're sort of looking for. And I see people, as you say, they use it as my HRV is low, I shouldn't train hard today. And that could be further from the truth. I've seen people come in with lower HRV and come in and hit PBs. I've seen people come in with great HRV and, and have a terrible session. Like there's so many things at play what comes to a good training performance. And also if you, it's, it's, if you think about, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, right? If you go into the gym going, oh, my HRV is low, it's going to be a terrible session. Well, then, of course, it's going to be a terrible session. Yeah, Whereas if you, true, think, true, if you true. go in and think, I'm going to smash this, regardless of HRV, you're more likely to smash it. Yeah, and, and that's it. And that's what I mean. Like, sometimes you just got to get in there and get it done. It's not just HRV. Like, you're, like do you want to explain what HRV is for anyone that doesn't understand it quickly? Just, like, really briefly? Yeah, so essentially, HRV is heart rate variability. So in the most simplistic way possible, it's the time between the beats. And you yeah. want a high heart rate variability that shows your resilience to stress is good. So you can you can respond to stressful situations and then come back to baseline well. Um, yeah. 
so you want the over time you want to see your hrv go up that shows you're getting fitter that shows your stress response is getting better if it's going down it shows you maybe going into overtraining or under recovered or breaking yeah. down yeah. so I'll, I'll add to that so it's a yes like you say it's a measure of your autonomic system and part of that autonomic system is that sympathetic side which is your your um fight or flight feed and fuck system and the and the parasympathetic side which is more of that rest and digest and yeah in between beats blah 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 and and but just so people are aware that you know there are three factors that can determine or well, can affect your hrv right lifestyle factors alcohol hydration nutrition um biological factors such as your age so as you get older your hrv will naturally decrease this um gender genetics and then um the last one is um what's the last one training, training, training. <laughs> training. Yeah. volume intensity days all that sort of shit rest periods all that sort of shit um yeah so HRV i think we're important. seeing a trend here aren't we with all these metrics and things track it's like everything has got to be taken with a pinch of salt like people got in great shape before all this tech came about yeah. it's useful the more metrics you track the more data you have you, you you know you can manage what you measure but that yeah. being said no piece of data in isolation tells you everything and there are flaws in every single metric and hrv is no different yeah yeah exactly yeah 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 i agree i agree um i don't even use hrv that much like there are more simple ways to um measure whether someone is under recovered right we've um, just asked them some questions you know how was your sleep you know, normally that's the first one that becomes impaired, right? Your sleep. So how was your sleep? How's your energy? How's your mood? How's your fatigue today? Mm. You know, normal questions, right? And I also think as well, this is where trainers learning about the different signs of a training, depending on the stimulus you're looking for. Because HRV will probably go down if you're overtrained anyway, but it only tells you, look, you are overtrained rather than what's actually going on. Whereas if I look at somebody who's done, let's say, a strength block for five, six weeks, the signs of overtraining are going to look a little bit different from someone who's done a high volume block for five or six weeks. Yeah, true. Someone who's, yeah. Someone who's doing a strength block, you might, you're going to see more nervous system fatigue. You're going to see the sleep. You're going to see brain fog. You're going to see those sort of issues. You're going to see like fatigue issues like, man, I'm exhausted. Someone who's doing a high volume block, you might get niggles and tendonitis and you might yeah. be sore for a really long time. Both of yeah. those are overtraining in different ways. And you yeah. can then either do your traditional deload or, and this is a different day, topic for a different day, maybe this is next week's podcast, but, or you can switch the stimulus. Okay, I'm going to do a high nervous system thing whilst I recover from this, is hence why people do, you know, accumulation intensification phases. So I think HRV, is, it's, it could be useful to see trends in someone's fitness and show them that they're improving and increase motivation that way. But it, it wouldn't be how I would track things because I want to know more about what's going on than you are just overtrained. Cool, but I, what what is going on? Is your nervous system fucked? Is, is, do you need to change your exercises? This, this, it's too basic a factor. Yeah, it's like I, saying, yeah, I, I want to lose weight. What are you doing with your nutrition? Yes, I'm eating food. Rather than saying how many calories you yeah. are and what's going and, on. And, and that's it. It's just a little bit of much that we can take, you know what I mean? And make adjustments, uh, look at and, you know, but a, a high heart, a, a good high HRV shows that you are capable of adapting. Mm. Yeah. But you need to establish a baseline for everyone, right? Exactly. And that's why it doesn't matter where people start, right? As long as you see where they're going, which is yes. the main factor. I think yeah. for me, like moving on to sort of like the practical sides of things, I mean, I, 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 I like, again, the biggest problem I have with tech in, in any sense, sense, it's it's almost managing. As you can see, for people who watch this on YouTube, I am not wearing my Apple Watch or my Aura Ring. Mm. Why is that? Because we're in a world today where I've, I've got to come home and I've got to charge my watch, my ring, my laptop, my iPad, my phone. What else do I have to charge? Um, probably, you know, my camera, my, you know, like there's so much stuff now that we have to charge that yeah. something's got to fall by the wayside. So are you going to, if you're going to invest in a piece of tech like this, are you generally going to use it enough to make your money's worth back? Yeah, true. And this true. is almost my problem, particularly with the root band. This is where I think is, it's 
I th- why I didn't get a whoop band, even though I think it's probably the most user friendly because you can train with it and it teaches you training stuff. Whereas Aura doesn't, and you you absolutely destroy it. You scratch it to hell by yeah. going into the gym with with a with an Aura on. So and it hurts when you're trying to grab a dumbbell with it. Yeah. But the Whoop is a subscription. And oh, I have okay. so many subscriptions, especially if you're a business owner. You're going to have Active Campaign and Zapier and Calendly and Google Drive and Storage. And it's just another subscription on top of the pile. I would much rather pay for something outright and I don't have that cost hanging over my head. Yep. Yep. And use it as you will. Yep. 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 I presume your Garmin is a one off cost, right? Yeah, it's a one off cost. And then I get the app on the phone. So it's just. If I ever want to look at it, I look at it. It's just, yeah, that's it. Done. You know, I'm sure there's additional things that you can do, maybe subscription based. I don't think there is, but um, yeah, I think you know, that's why the Apple Watch is also good. You know what I mean? Because it's just a one off purchase. And then, you know what I mean? That's it. Done, isn't it? Like you can purchase the apps and stuff, but you can tell the time. You can t- use it as a step tracker, which is very accurate. You can use it as a heart rate tool which is pretty accurate as well yeah the smart watches are pretty accurate at resting heart rates um what else oxygen saturation is pretty accurate as well and people forget you could do a lot of this stuff on your phone so like you can measure you can measure there's a um thing where you put your finger over your camera to measure hrv and while that's not necessarily the most accurate method of doing it if anyone follows joel jameson's work who's probably the the, the guy that's put more science and research into HIV than almost anyone else on the planet with yeah. athletes. He, he, he says it's a valid use, use of it. It's not his favorite, but it's, it's not rubbish enough that he doesn't mention it. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. you know, like the, do we need to buy extra pieces when our phone does a lot of this? It does our steps. It does everything else. Like a lot of stuff can be done for our phone. So I think it's just, are you willing and are you going to make the most of that investment? What, what, what I'm aware, right. With all these companies. Yeah. Like Garmin, Apple, like all of their tech that they use in these watches, et cetera, are very, very similar. It's the, it's the money that they spend on the secret algorithms that create the data is what are more advanced in certain products than others. So that, that's where the difference is. And that's where I think like, you know, watches that aren't reliable and then watches that are reliable. You know I mean? That, that's where you pay but a better quality because it's better. It's better. It's not better tech, but it's better algorithms that they use to put your data together. That's what I think. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree. I think the, 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 I will always be glad though. I got my aura ring for something completely irrelevant. Um, yeah. The aura ring played a huge role in me planning my proposal. So I'll <laughs> always be grateful for it. This is always worth telling the story. I, um, I, I came to the, you know, f- finally after way too long came to the conclusion I was going to propose to Ellie and I ordered my aura ring and someone says to me like you can either get your sizing kit for free where they send you like these loads of these different rings and you can try them on and find which one or you can I, uh, you know you can, if you have one you don't need it and I had a friend of mine that was like oh I can lend you mine and I was like no because I know what Ellie's going to do I know when the sizing kit comes she's going to start trying them all on on a ring finger and make the joke about oh well this is my size so I went and I did it and I took that one and I put it in my bag and I took that to the, uh, the, the ring shop where I got the engagement ring made and I went, this is her size. Go and make it. And for that, it will be, no matter how much or how little I use the oar ring, it'll be always worth the investment. So if any guys are here and want to propose to their girlfriend um, this is the way and you want to get a fitness deck, this is the way to do it because I guarantee you they'll start, when you see loads of different ring sizes, They'll start trying them on and you can take that to a store. You know, that's that. I'll give you that bit of advice for free. So with, with the aura ring, like you can choose your size. Yeah. Like how, how, how did you know what size to get? Like, so you send this ring sizing kit. So they have literally um, lots of oh, different so- aura, pla- like plastic aura rings that have no tech in them oh, and you get sorry. loads of them and you, you basically just try them all on, whichever one fits, oh, cool. you go online, you go eight was size F and then they send you a, they send you an aura ring that size. Cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah, cool. And then, or an engagement ring of that size, but Aura didn't make her engagement ring. I'll, 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 I'll tell you that. That would be a, that'd be a bit of a cop out. Um, cool. Yeah, I can check. What? I'll check Ellie's HRV on a, on our wedding day. Um, so what, just finish. Go on. Go on. Matthew. 
Well, I was just going to say, like, you know, with, with, the, um, with the step um, counters on your watches and stuff, like, they're pretty accurate. And, um, like, I, I think there's, there's, there was a research paper that came out where they reviewed, like, thousands of different um, papers on people that were wearing watches like this tech. And they found that, um, this was at June or July of this year, I think, they, they basically said that wearing these watches can get people walking up to 40 minutes more each day because they're more accountable. That's huge. So that, that's, that's good. Like get yourself a watch or something that can track because it can help encourage you to get out there and get your step count in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think as well, it, people get them and they get things like Strava and they start competing against their friends and we've got an Apple Watch. Yeah, they become more accountable to it. Um, yeah. Even if it's not more accurate, they consciously walk more. Yeah. And it takes away the excuses. How many times do you have time to go, oh, I left my phone in my bag? But if they've got themselves an Apple Watch, you, you never have that excuse again, right? So you don't have the excuse to be lazy and they're more accountable to do more. Um, although I will say, I wonder sometimes how accurate these things are. That if you wave your wrist or do whatever yeah. else, or if you're a guy that that's a you know a serial masturbator, how many steps do you reckon you're doing <laughs> for every cheeky wank that you do? <laughs> I will. I think like pedometers, ped pedometers. Yes, the word. Yeah. I don't think they use them in watches because they're not as accurate. Whereas I think the watches use accelerometers, which kind of measure like three directions or something. So. Oh. Um, maybe a step count is going up if you're doing this a lot. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, Mate, test it. Test it. Like next week's show, next week's show how, many, how many wanking steps did we get done? Well, I wear my week? watch on my left hand. Oh, well, I mean, that was a rookie mistake, mate. I also wear my watch on my left hand, but I'm a lefty. <laughs> Always get more steps in the day. Always get more steps. Um, I'll tell you what, tell you what the um, watches are good for, though, as well, like measuring your oxygen saturation levels. Like with COVID, um, that when people get COVID, right, they, they, their oxygen saturation drops, but it, it drops to a level that's dangerous, but they don't get any, uh, basically, ox you know what oxygen saturation is like. They don't know as much about it as, as, as you do. So yeah, feel free. All, it, all it is, is basically um, how, how much oxygen is, is in, your, in your red blood cells. Yeah. So how much oxygen you've got in your body and it's out of a hundred percent and healthy individual will be between 95 and 100 percent and if you get 90 percent and below you you're basically deemed as um um anemic yeah so when when people get covid their um saturation oxygen levels decline right but not but what happens is um the decline they don't show any breathlessness issues so it's, it's dangerous but they're unaware that there's a drop so your watches can track that that's interesting. I didn't. I, did, I, I didn't even know that. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, so I mean, so you could. You could. You know when you go. You know when you go to the hospital. Yeah. And they put the they put the thing on your finger. Yeah. That that's what that is. That's what that's tracking. So Oxygen you always use it as a precursor to getting COVID. Like you can start to realize that you're maybe yeah, coming maybe, down yeah. with something yeah. and maybe stay indoors yeah. and potentially stopping yeah. the spread. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so the Hong Kong government should do. Should everyone Apple watches. Yeah, so when it goes too low, you cause hypoxia. You know what I mean? Lack of oxygen. That's really interesting. I never even, I never even, even thought to look into that. That's really yeah. interesting point. And and from what I'm aware, it's pretty reliable and accurate from the watches. So hmm. maybe not to a healthcare standard, but you know, hmm. so interesting. It's good to look at. You know what I mean? Moving into sort of like um, we're going to move finish off with a couple of training devices. But the one thing I just quickly want to talk about: what's your sort of like smart body weight scales? You know the scales that sort of measure body fats and all this other stuff, muscle mass, skeletal muscle mass. What's your thoughts on those? Because you know I've, like, I've seen people that weigh way too much stock in this. Yeah, you know what? I, I encourage my clients just to use um, a weighing scale to measure their body weight, not all that other fucking shit. I've had people say, oh, you know, this and that, and they're using this and that. And I, I just take it with a pinch of salt. If they want to do it, that's fine. But let, come on, it's not, I, you know, it's not accurate. And it's not reliable. Um, so it's, it's pointless. But some people like doing that. You know what I mean? So whatever. Like, the problem with bioelectrical impedance scales in general, right, is that hydration level affects them dramatically. So you get clients who lose five kilos. They've dropped 10 centimeters around the waist. And they go, oh, my body fat says I've gone up. Uh, if, when I get that sort of stuff, when they, you know, they're, they're, they're putting too much stock in this as a body fat reading, 
I will, I will always go, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to take it in the morning. I want you to drink like a litre of water. I want you to come back and take it again and see what's happened. You've not got fatter in 20 minutes. Yeah. The difference is astronomical. Yeah, big time, big time. I mean, like, yeah, I don't, I don't like, I encourage my clients not to use that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? And um, if anyone is listening and using that, then um, I highly discourage you. <laughs> yeah, just take your body weight, take an average, and yeah, see man. From there. Yeah. So going into fitness tech, like, like the nerd stuff now, there's a couple of pieces of advice I want to talk about. But first off is one I know you own. Tell me about your speed devices. So I have a... Um, uh, a speed device called a push band and the push band is basically a um it's called a imu accelerometer an inertial measurement unit thing and it basically measures concentric speed so concentric speed for anyone that doesn't understand it's sort of the pushing of the bench or the throwing of a ball or the the upward part of a jump it measures the speed and you get two different measures of speed you can me- measure the mean speed the mean velocity or the peak velocity and and you'll choose one of those depending on um what you're trying to achieve from your training session um i got it because i used it on one of my studies where we were measuring uh, mean concentric velocity so yeah that that's basically a summary of what it how is how much use do you have it since is it does it does it play a big factor in in training do you find it particularly useful not for general pop certainly not for general pop can it be used certainly can um how would i use it with uh, my athletes well we'd use it for my athletes like for those reasons i just mentioned you know for for measuring power for measuring fatigue um for like readiness it can measure readiness you know like um you know if you have someone do three counter movement jumps and you, you know what their um power output is um, when they come in and train, you can put the push band on their arm and get them to do three jumps. And if they're below a certain, you know, if they're if their percentage is down a certain amount, then you may need to tweak your training session because it's an indication they're under they're not fully recovered. Um, so it's a readiness tool. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, um, do you attach it to the bar well as, or the person? Um, both. You can use both. Yeah. So like, if we're measuring barbell velocity, then obviously we attach it to the bar to measure, you know, the speed on the squat or the bench or the, the power clean. Or if you're doing jumps, you can just attach it onto the arm and jump. Um, mm. Yeah. Now we think those things are interesting as well. Like some of the things we look at in terms of data, it's more about what it, what it provides the client and awareness sometimes is more important than the actual data that comes out from itself. Like we all see people that think they've hit one rep in reserve, but the, you know, they've got 12 left. And you could probably show that with that speed. Like, okay, put this on the bar and I want to, we're going to measure the speed in this set. And if you see that speed doesn't drop at all through the set, it's like, you know, you've got more in there because you would see a drop in this. And sometimes just a visual representation can show so much. Like Kaiser strength. Have you seen the Kaiser strength machines now yeah. where they yeah. basically measure all this in the, in the machine. Um, that is like, can be really useful, I think, just to make clients aware and also know how to beat it. So they want to go slower. They want to have more control rather than this arbitrary, well, my coach is telling me to go slower, but that makes it harder and I want to lift more weight. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, they're good to use for the, those, you know what I mean? And, and like predicting where someone is to failure. Um, I use it sometimes for that as well, but I suppose with coaching experience, you you, you learn, um, you learn that you know what I mean. Um, you see it, and it's nice, thing, right? Yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. But saying that, the more experienced you are, the more you can grind reps at higher percentages. So, um, you know what I mean. Like if you're doing a one or three or five rep max, you can grind the last one or two at slow speeds because you are intermediate to experience and you have the technique the technique and the experience of pushing through slower speeds whereas a beginner may fail earlier because they don't have the experience and the ability to grind you know what i mean Mm. yeah absolutely absolutely i think that's a really important way to close off on that the last Mm. one i want to talk about because it's become more and more popular now um 
is EMG studies. Mm. There's mm. more and more coaches using EMG studies to prove X, Y, and Z. Oh, but do you think it, useful? To prove people or to prove about muscles firing. I mean, it's good to use, but fucking hell. I mean, in biomechanics, it's obviously good to use, but there's a lot of limitations to it as well. Tell me, tell me about some of those limitations. Well, most people, unless you're in a lab, you're going to use surface EMG, right? That will just pick up, you know, muscles that we can see, you know, it doesn't, it, it can't really measure um, deeper muscles and finer muscles. So there, there's a limitation there, you know, um, and, and there's, you know, other factors like um, the settings and, um, you know, how much body fat someone has on them, blood flow to a muscle, um, those things will affect the contraction of the muscle unit, you know? Um, so there's, there's things that can't be controlled for. And know? I suppose as well, like a lot of people using these now don't have the sample size to actually notice that. So if, if you're saying like the level of body fat will affect it, yeah. um, blood flow will affect it. then Lactic to, acid, uh, blood yeah. flow, um, the, the diameter of the muscle fiber, motor units, all those sort of things, you know? If, if to iron out those things to make EMGs more useful, you would need a huge sample size. So you yeah. need to say we had, a, we had 500 people and they we all attached to a lat and it proved that this way of doing the lat pull down was more effective for the lat. But if you're doing it yeah. with one to three people, does it show that much or is there too many back factors? Well, that that's where you use, you know, those, it, it, they're called, those are called intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. The extrinsic factors are the ones that can be controlled for. So the, the quality of your design, so partic participants and quality technology and all that sort of shit. You know what I mean? So they can be, um, they can be controlled, but you do need a fair amount of people. You know what I mean? Um, and yet you've got to also standardize you. The more people you have, you've got to standardize the execution of the lift, which, yeah, good point. you know, good like, point. like people don't learn execution in a day. So, mm. Some people will get it really, really well. So we'll go, well, neutral grip pull downs are better for lats. Well, it depends how well someone does the neutral grip pull down. Yeah, yeah. So like, and that's where it can help us understand what causes the most mechanical stress on muscles and muscle groups. But remember, everyone has different moment arms and therefore produces different torques. So... <laughs> levers may have will affect muscle recruitment obviously so you know, and again, everyone's unique that, you, right exactly so it's how you know your your subjects and all that sort of shit you know what i mean that you can you know what i mean control um so yeah do, i mean i think for normal people it's overkill you know what i mean if you're a biomechanist or whatever then you should be using it and I, I think it's good what people are doing it, doing it for, you know, like trying to like see what muscles are being recruited the most and all that sort of stuff. I think it's great. Um, but there are other things that you can do, right. To see if the muscles firing, like um, ask a question, you know, can you feel that there or <laughs> touch the muscle? Oh uh, yeah. I can feel Much that cheaper. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's easy to do. Um, so when you move, when you like, actually, when you're at rest, the muscle is still firing because it has to maintain muscle tone and um, like temperature. So there is some, you know, there is it, you, you, muscle is firing still. Um, and then when you want to move, um, there's electrical impulse at the brain that travels to the central and peripheral nerves, which are at the end of the at the end of that is a motor unit in the muscle. And then um, that's where your nervous system and your muscle system become one. And then you get a contraction. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think the way of like telling this off, I think what we've shown with all the tech things is mm. that they have all have their place. Yeah. They but, do. They do. but they all have their place, but no one of these metrics can be taken as gospel. No, no. one, no, no, that it's HRV, EMG, speed velocity steps use they're, them all. They're, yeah they use as many or as few as you feel capable of if mm. you feel it's gonna like be more stress than it's worth don't use it and if you think if you're gonna focus on one i think it's gonna be like like i shouldn't train because my hrv is low or i have to do this exact way of doing a pull down because i saw an emg study on one person that did it step back 
look at other metrics, everything is 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 integrated into a bigger picture. And yeah. we, we, there are simpler ways of doing this. People managed to get in great shape before there was tech. It's useful, yeah. but it's not necessary. Yeah, exactly. I, I, like I said, you know, like EMG is good for like more um, uh, neurological sort of things and, and biomechanics, but like, you know, it's how you, you know, see whether people have diseases and shit like that. You know what I mean? They put do you follow needles. Jack's, do you follow Jack Taylor? No. Instagram. You should. He's, a, he's, he's really delved into the nervous system and he does a lot of this stuff and he's super clever. And he's also, I tell you what, if you want to learn stuff and also get a good night's sleep, he has the world's most soothing voice. It's like a scientific Barry White. It's unbelievable. Scientific Barry White. Yeah, mate. God, jeez. Like if it, Sounds sexy. Yeah, literally, literally. I question my sexuality every time I listen to him talk about the nervous system. It's so soothing. So what the what they're um I think it's a university in the US, I think. They're basically working on um, this EMG device that you basically keep on your skin for several days. And it's for, obviously it's not for biomechanics uh, and like, you know, or it's just, it's basically for like, it should help people, you know, that have um, like neural problems. Like, so if you have a stroke, the first couple of weeks after having the stroke is really, really important to see how you progress and, like you basically you, in the first few weeks after having a stroke, you have to train neural circuits to help improve motor function. So like having that sort of stuff on your body for several days can help them assess whether you're improving or not. So that's the way, that's where the EMG stuff's going from a medical perspective. You know what I mean? And that may, may help, you know, in our field as well. I don't know. Like, especially if you're dealing with those older populations that so people are more prone yeah, to falls and, you know, yeah, issues yeah, yeah. and things like this. This could that could be really, really useful. Mm, mm. So I think well, I think we'll we'll, we'll call it there because I think we've really discussed the tech and the home gym stuff, and I think that's been really, really, really useful. So for people who want to learn more about you, I know you've been on the show a few times, but if this is the first one that they've listened to, how do people find you? Whether it's working with you in your home gym in Oz, or whether that is working with you online. If you'd like to work with me in person, I'm in Perth, northern suburbs. But you can always email me at stephen at stephencollingetraining.com or visit my website or my socials, which is Stephen Collins Training. Hmm. And yet your and your content at the moment, regards to training stuff and this stuff is, is really good. So definitely give Steve a yeah, follow. Thanks, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah. No worries, Tom, man. Thank you very much for coming on. Cheers, boss. Hey, guys. Thank you very much for watching the podcast. If you're like me and like to binge watch podcast episodes, click here for our most recent episode. And if you enjoy the show and want to be updated when new videos come live, click here to subscribe to the channel.